I'm on the River X, just outside Exeter. Gateway, it says in the guidebooks, to the West Country. This, the second leg of our journey around the entire coast of the United Kingdom, takes us through Devon, Cornwall and Somerset, the southwest of England, where the genteel English Riviera meets the merciless Atlantic. From this coast, heroic navigators set sail on voyages of discovery. But it's also where so many came to grief, the victims of shipwrecks and storms. Wild weather, wild coastlines, and a wildness of spirit. This is the Wild West of England. This is where, like a lot of people, I used to come on those classic Famous Five holidays in search of secret coves and smugglers' caves. I'm not travelling alone. There are also five of us. We've got a historian, Neil Oliver, to help uncover the human stories behind the dates. Oh. <laughs> and an anthropologist too, Alice Roberts, who discovers how a whole village was washed away in just a few hours. We also have our own zoologist, Miranda Krestovnikov, who's off in search of some of our more alarming summer visitors. While archaeologist Mark Horton get to the bottom of one of Cornwall's most enduring myths, wrecking. Together, we'll take you on a journey to the southwest rim of our country, to where Britain and the Atlantic fight their biggest battles. This is the story of Coast. The next part of our journey takes us 384 miles, from Exmouth, down to Land's End and back up to Bristol. I'm on the river ferry which plies its trade on the Exmouth estuary. Dorset is behind us, here we're in South Devon. This is Star Cross on what the brochures call the English Riviera. And on a glorious day like this it could almost be the Mediterranean. But as anyone who's spent their summer holiday sitting on a windswept beach will know, it's not always like this. 2,000 miles out in the Atlantic, weather fronts build, bring up great storms. Westerly winds hurl those storms right at us, gaining strength all the way. The first part of the UK they hit is the southwest. The west-facing extremes of this coastline take the full brunt of the weather. No wonder most of the villages here are built on the more sheltered east coast. But the prevailing westerlies don't always prevail. With little warning, the winds can swing around and arrive from the other direction. At their worst, they don't just buffet the coast, they obliterate it. If we travel from Exmouth to Start Bay, you'll see what I mean. Sandwiched between the sea and a freshwater lake is the east-facing village of Tor Cross. Although it's been here a thousand years, it's under a growing threat. The coastal road to Tor Cross runs alongside Slapton Sands, a beach which acts as a natural barrier, protecting the road village and the lake from invasion by the sea. Every year when the weather gets rough, the waves try to crash through this ridge and the council have to rush in and conduct emergency repairs both to the road and to the ridge. And without those repairs, they say that the road and the lake are going to be gone in 50 years. Sea levels in the southwest have risen by 15 centimetres over the last 90 years. Combine that with the natural erosion of shingle and dredging, and you have a recipe for disaster. What's worrying the villagers of Tor Cross is that one day they might lose not just the road, but the village as well. 
And this is not just about what could happen. It already has happened to our neighbours just up the coast. This used to be the thriving fishing community of Hall Sands. Once there were homes, shops and a pub. All now gone. The villagers were used to battling with the elements, but nobody could have predicted what happened one night in 1917 when the whole village fell victim to the forces of nature. Anthropologist Alice Roberts has travelled here to learn the full story of what happened on that terrible night. As you can see, it's very steep. I'm with the local historian Steve Mellier, who's been unearthing the true story of Hall Sands. This is the uh, main street and um, difficult to imagine now, but there were buildings on both sides of it. So how many houses were there originally in Hall Sands? At its height, there were uh, 37 houses with 159 people. Right, as far as I can see, it's just ruins, isn't it? Yes. Everybody kind of owed part their living either directly or indirectly to the sea. The beach had a shingle ridge, which was high enough and protected enough for it to be able to leave the boats on the beach all year round. It's entirely disappeared now. Where we are standing here, these were the foundations of the London Inn, the only pub in the village. So presumably there wasn't just a sheer drop down here at that point? No, I mean, the, the sand and shingle came up to the level of this rock platform. Before the storm, there would have been a path leading up to the front of this house. Today, I can only get to it on the end of a rope. Rope Oh! <laughs> I wonder what it must have been like on that terrible night. On January the 26th, 1917, the wind and waves had been building up all day until by nightfall, it was a horrendous storm. I've got a tape here with the words of Edith Pacey, who was one of the survivors of that dreadful night back in 1917. We were counting the waves and every wave seemed to be more heavier than the last one. And we were counting nine, and we thought, well, nine, this one will be a bigger one. And then it was rolling over the rooftops and breaking all the thatch roof in, the boards, you know, all the rafters. It's a very high wave that does the damage. And we could see the floor slipping away, the coal house slipping away, all of it going down to a huge pit. It couldn't be repaired, beyond repair, but yet this little place stands as a sacred memory. The amazing thing about that night was that nobody was killed, and in fact nobody was even seriously injured but the village was completely ruined. In the past, the village had had its fair share of severe weather and survived, but on this night there were other forces at work, which together proved catastrophic. Oceanographer Vince May has studied the role played by the Bay's geology in turning bad weather into disaster. I still don't understand why Paul Sands in particular is affected there. I mean, why that village out of all the villages along the coast here? It was a combination of high tides, strong winds, mm. and a lot of shingle removed by dredging. The village's misfortune was its shingle beach. Left alone, it provided the village with valuable protection against the wind and waves. But shingle was worth a lot of money particularly when, in 1897, Sir John Jackson's engineering company was given a licence to dredge it up and sell it. How much, how much dredging was there? I mean, what, 
they What's took the out 600,000 tonnes of shingle from that along like here. That's a huge amount. It's probably something like 12, 15 times more than the material in this beach at the moment. You can see here the old village of Hull Sands. Right. And then you can see that the beach goes round in front of the headland, so you could have walked around in front of it. You couldn't do that today. With British naval power at its peak, Hall Sands shingle really came into its own, a vital ingredient in the huge new building programme underway at the Devonport Naval Base just up the coast. It was the glory days of the empire and nobody was listening to the complaints of a few villagers. Commander Charles Crichton knows the story better than anyone. Just look at this here. I mean, this just is one of the docks, 700 feet long, largely built of concrete. So, so this is it. This is the concrete. This is where the the whole sand shingle. Well, concrete, went. absolutely. I mean, there was about a million tons used. Of course, the basic constituent is sand and gravel. Mm. Hence, all that material which was brought in. Devonport got its big new docks, and Sir John Jackson made himself a fortune. Hall Sands, however, was doomed. A hundred of its inhabitants were driven out forever, their homes and livelihoods smashed. It became just another piece of coastal wreckage littering the southwest. These storms and catastrophes have never stopped the influx of people drawn to this coast, mesmerised by the beauty of its coves and sandy beaches. This is Burr Island, where the 1930s fast set danced the night away in magnificent Art Deco surroundings. And before them, way before them, other seekers of the good life flocked here. As far back as the 6th century, local traders came here to meet their Mediterranean counterparts, swapping tin and iron for wine, spices and silks. It's natural if you live on the coast to look out across the waves for adventure and opportunity. And that tradition is nowhere more evident than in Devon's number one port. It was from Plymouth that the Pilgrim Fathers sailed to America on the Mayflower in 1620 and Charles Darwin in 1831 for the Galapagos Islands. But without doubt, Plymouth's most celebrated son is the chap on the pedestal, the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe and scourge of the Spanish, Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake! Drake, Drake, where is Drake? Master Drake, because the, the, the Spaniards are upon us! Oh. We all know the legend of the unflappable hero who refused to interrupt his game of bowls. It was time to finish the game and beat the Spaniards too. <laughs> Let him have it. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 made Drake a national hero. But what the myths and the swashbuckling movies left out was the story of how Drake made his fortune in the first place. Like so many superheroes, it seems that Sir Francis had a sinister side. A historian who knows the less wholesome truth behind one of our great British heroes is Neil Hansen. I think there's a great tendency in, the, in this country to imagine Sir Francis Drake in a, a direct line through to uh, Horatio Nelson, to imagine the Navy at the time was this incredibly well-disciplined and well-organised body. It simply wasn't true, and Drake and John Hawkins and the rest of those great Elizabethan heroes are all, frankly, pirates, and uh, many of them, including Hawkins and Drake, are also slave traders. Drake and his cousin, Sir John Hawkins, sailed from Plymouth to West Africa, where they rounded up local natives, put them in chains, and took them across the Atlantic. There they were sold as slaves to Spanish plantation owners in return for hides, ginger, and pearls. Hawkins and Drake were the first Englishmen to profit from what would become a multi-million pound trade in human traffic. And how much money did they make? Is there any record of that? 
There is, yeah, they, they made an absolute fortune. In today's prices, Drake was a millionaire, Sir John Hawkins was a millionaire. So you're saying that my boyhood figurehead, this Elizabethan swashbuckling explorer, was actually sowing the seeds of one of the most shameful episodes in British history? Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. The, the slave trade, the infamous slave trade, which later made ports like uh, Liverpool and Bristol stupendously wealthy, was actually founded here in Plymouth by Sir John Hawkins and Sir Francis Drake. Both were knighted for it and both made fortunes from it. By the time slavery was abolished two and a half centuries later, European ships had taken 12 million Africans to the Americas, the largest forced migration in history. Outside Plymouth, the River Tamar marks the next great western frontier. We're in Cornwall now. Surrounded by the sea, Britain's most westerly county is practically an island. 2,000 years ago, Iron Age Celts from all over Europe settled here, giving this part of the country a very particular identity. You only have to visit a local churchyard to see clues to its Celtic heritage. Everywhere you look in this graveyard, you find names that you just don't see in the rest of England. There's a Truin, just over here, there's a Tregoning, and here, there's a Trelease. But the Celtic connections don't stop there. One of the great landmarks along this stretch of coast is St Michael's Mount a mirror image of its French cousin, Mont Saint-Michel. Five miles across Mounts Bay is Newlyn, where fishing has traditionally been the mainstay of the economy. Fishing for pilchards in particular has been part of life here for centuries. This is a lookout, where in the past, a boy known as a hewer would be posted to look for signs of pilchards in the water. When the hewer spotted the pilchard shoal in the bay below, he'd let out a hue or a cry to the waiting fishing boats below, hence the term hue and cry. Hewers are just a distant memory, like the hundreds of little fishing boats that used to crowd the harbour. As in so many places around our coast, the fishing industry in Newlyn is in decline. But this industry is not going down without a fight. Some fishermen, determined to reverse this trend, have developed new ways of fishing, combining traditional techniques with modern technology. The results are rich pickings. I've come here to meet Stefan Glinski, who's managed to increase his catch of pilchards by 50 times. I want to find out how he's done it. We um, went out and we spent £100,000 on a boat. It was a risk. We didn't know whether the fishery would work, whether we could catch the fish or not. But we, could, we saw that stock was there when we were catching other fish. And I thought, yeah, we'll have a go at that and see, see how we do. And these are pilchards, yes, you're catching? Pilchards or Cornish sardines. What's the difference between a sardine and a pilchard? Nothing at all, actually. Uh, the pilchard is the Cornish name for a, a very big sardine. To see the secrets of Stefan's success in action, I've catched a ride on his boat for a night's fishing. Are we going to find any tonight? We'll probably find them, probably further off tonight where it's rougher. Rougher. <laughs> We've got a shoal on the sonar now. How many tonnes of fish do you reckon? I'd estimate that about 60, 70 tonnes of fish. Do you feel a bit like a hunter after a quarry? Yes, it's like a lion stalking it. Which way are you going to go? Which are you going to do? Yeah. Can you move faster than I can move? Yeah. And bang, hit it. How are you, you going to pick the moment to actually shoot the net? It's gut instinct, watching what they do. I'm going to shut all the lights off now so they won't be scared okay. by them. So this is the boat's closed down in hunting mode now? Yeah, we're coming right alongside that shoulder fish there at the moment. 
what happens is they might dive any moment. Yeah, right, I'm going to need you to be quiet now because okay. they're just about. Right, okay, guys, shoot away. Go. Stefan's real innovation is in the nets he uses. These so called ring nets are a centuries old design and have a mesh so fine they don't damage the fish. So instead of being squashed into cans with tomato sauce, they can be sold pristine at a much higher value. This is really exciting. There's a huge tension and anxiety on the boat now. The speed of the net over the side is absolutely terrifying. You've got one foot stuck and you'll be dragged clean over the edge into the water. Incredibly dangerous activity. Stefan, what's going on now? What we're doing is we've shot the net in a circle. Now the rope is going through the rings on the bottom of the net. We're pulling it in to close the fish in. In the back of the boat, the seagulls are going absolutely berserk because they can sense the fish that are coming out of the water. At any moment now, we're going to start seeing what's in this net. You see them sort of oh, around yeah. the birds are jumping yeah, on them? Yeah, yeah. It looks like we've got about half a tonne of fish in there. Fill my shopping bag up, I can tell you. Yeah. Stefan's lifting in 100 kilos at a time of pilchards. Incredible moment after all the stalking and the circling and the netting to drag him in and chuck him in here and see what the catch is. These fish have got no damage with the gills at all, which you get with a gill net fish. And so they aren't squashed at all either, because we yeah. handle them in small quantities, lifting them up. Then they aren't squashed, so they're perfect. They bring them ashore undamaged. Yeah, beautiful condition. Yeah, lovely. We're going to go around and shoot again after this? Probably four or five times tonight oh, to right. make a cargo. Okay. So that a long night. A few hours later, those same fish are at Newlin Fish Market. It's down to the auctioneer, Robin Turner, to get the best price. If this is Stefan's catch from last night. It's a fantastic pile of fish. How do you sum up Stefan's contribution to the fishing market here in Newlin? Well, Stefan is, uh, is a very successful individual. I would say he probably catches approximately 50% of the sardines that go through Newlin every year. And uh, on monetary value, he stands to earn between two and three thousand pounds per night out of his cat. This fish has literally been out of the sea for two and a half hours. Now, that is fantastic. And what's helped the marketing is the fact they're no longer labelled as pilchards. Instead, they're sold as Cornish sardines. Delicacies, rich in flavour and natural oils. It works. Sales have doubled in the last year. And these are good for you, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, it's a very firm flesh, isn't mm, it? Excellent fish. Travelling west of Newlin, we reach the wildest point of our Wild West journey so far. It's the very tip of the mainland. If you're making a journey around the whole coast, there are two places you absolutely have to go to. John O'Groats and Land's End. I first came here as a kid, picnicking on these cliffs. Then I returned as a grown-up and cycled the 874 miles from here all the way to John O'Groats in Scotland. But this isn't the Land's End I remember. Back in the 1980s, some bright spark turned it into a theme park. I can see that for lots of people this is bags of fun, but if, like me, the Land's End experience is not quite to your taste, a few steps beyond, you're back in the real thing. And here we say goodbye to the sheltered south coast and hello to the exposed north coast. And boy, is it wild! This coast has some of the most rugged and inhospitable terrain in England. Little wonder, then, that it's heaving with shipwrecks. But for most of us, my age or older, there's one wreck that we'll never forget. The Torrey Canyon, which ran aground between Land's End and the Scilly Isles in March 1967. 
the Italian captain decided to take a shortcut and ran the oil tanker onto a shallow reef. The result? The world got its first pictures of what a super tanker oil spillage looked like. Ninety-three miles of Cornish beach were drenched in oil. The fishing and tourist industries of the southwest suffered terribly, and 25,000 birds died. One of the local residents who immediately came to the rescue of the stricken birds was Roger Tonkin. The beach was covered in oil and covered in birds. Unfortunately, very many of them dead. Even after washing, a lot died. It was a bit distressing, but we collected hundreds that were alive. A holiday maker came up to our house with a guillemot that they'd found standing on the beach. And so we took it in and we had it running around the house for about a fortnight, walking around after my wife in the kitchen and it would come and sit with us in the evening by the fire. It was a dear little thing. Unfortunately, our knowledge of how to cope with this kind of oil spill was in its infancy. The strategy approved by Prime Minister Harold Wilson to pour millions of gallons of detergent on the oil only made things worse. Far from dispersing the slick, it created a gooey mess and toxic hazard all of its own. Eventually, they decided to incinerate the oil by bombing the tanker with napalm. For two months, the Torrey Canyon hung on lot on our conscience before sinking beneath the waves. There are other relics here too, at the western tip of the Cornish Peninsula. Pithead buildings, part of a once prosperous tin mining industry. Beneath these cliffs, men dug mine shafts, stretching two and a half miles out to sea. Our historian, Neil Oliver, has come here, just a few miles from Land's End, to find out more. At one time, Cornwall was producing an amazing half of all the world's tin. This mine at Giver dates back to the 18th century and was one of the very last to close. This is one of the few tin mines you can still see inside, but I had no idea it would be such an ordeal to get to. I'm going to explore it with Dave Harvey, who used to work as a tin miner himself. There was very, very well, uh, much uh, wealth of um, minerals in Cornwall. Certainly, mostly, as we can see leaching out of the rock there, uh, copper. Is now, that what that green that stripe green is? That green is copper coming out through... It's a copper mineral exuding through the, uh, through the tin. Did Cornwall offer rich pickings for miners? Very much so. Um, in Giver, we have virtually every mineral there is. There's copper, zinc, lead, tin, antimony, bismuth, arsenic, quite a lot of arsenic in the load, and there's certain uh, amounts of silver and gold as well. So virtually all of the elements in, in the mines at uh, Giver. Can you imagine? It would be bad enough having to go 2,000 feet underground to work. Never mind that these tunnels actually led out under the sea. Coming underground my first time, it was a quite a frightening experience. We were maybe 1,500 feet below ground. After walking about half an hour, we, we, would, we heard this sound, terrific noise from two machines. We could hardly see from the, from the oil from the machines and very, very poor air to breathe. I couldn't believe that people were working in conditions nowadays like that. Yeah. This is dreadful in here. So you were in tunnels as narrow as that? As narrow as that. But this is the world you lived in. This is the world, this is the world we lived in, this is the way we made our money. Now, you can see all the green in the, in the rock the up green, there. Again, that is your copper. 
So they see it on the outside and then they just burrow in, follow they the have, colours they that they can recognise. They would have followed that load in, just working his way, bringing all the minerals out. Is there any indication of how old this tunnel, this part of the mine is? It is actually difficult to say because records weren't kept prior to about 1850. And even before that, it's just a supposition really. But we reckon this certainly was being mined in the 1600s. Possibly hundreds before, of years old. Hundreds of years old. Okay. But cheaper labour costs and more accessible mines in Australia and South America spelt the end of Cornish tin mining. The last mine here closed seven years ago, bringing to an end an industry dating back over 2,000 years. 40 miles further up the coast, a new bonanza has sprung up. One that positively embraces the lashing winds and thumping waves that batter the Cornish coast. Surfing. Alice Roberts, our anthropologist, is no stranger to New Quay. There are an estimated 300,000 surfers in the UK who regularly brave the North Atlantic, and I'm one of them, even when the water is at its coldest in March. For years, Newquay had been a quiet, bucket and spade family resort of hotels and guest houses. The only surfing that was to be seen was a tame affair, lying on a short plywood bodyboard. That all changed in 1962 when Australian lifeguards appeared on the scene. As well as their fashionable swimwear, the Australian surfers brought us walking on water with their lighter plastic surfboards. Stand up wave riding had arrived. One of the locals who didn't object to the newcomers was veteran surfer Roger Mansfield. Roger, how old are you when you started surfing? Six. Really? Uh, well, that's <laughs> on, on, on the, on the lie-down wooden surfboards that were so popular at the time. But by 11 years old, I had the opportunity to learn to, to stand up surf right. here at Great Western Beach in Newquay. So it's obviously a good place for surfing. Well, it's really because of uh, Newquay's position on the north coast of Cornwall, uh, which is looking right out into the North Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. And there are lots of beaches, aren't there? They're all sort of slightly different angles. That's right, and that's, that's good for the surfing too, but as much as it provides a variety of angles to the ocean for different wave sizes and ways for the waves to face whatever was the local wind at the time. So how are waves formed, Roger? The real surfing waves are made by storms um, a thousand, two thousand miles out in the ocean. So it's like ripples on a pond, but on a massive scale. Very much so. If you throw a stone in the middle of a pond and you see those ripples coming out, imagine that stone is a big storm out in the ocean doing that on an ocean scale, yes. Yeah. Newquay is a town dominated by its new surfing industry. It generates an annual income of over £40 million, which easily puts it in the top bracket of British holiday resorts. I think it's time I got changed and had a go myself. This might look pretty stupid, but at this time of year, you don't want to be getting in the water without one of these on. It's far too cold. But the surf brings in more than money. The waves throw up two types of debris, flotsam and jetsam. The flotsam's the stuff that makes its way into the sea by chance, like these bits and bobs. The jetsam is the stuff that's jettisoned or thrown away, like these plastic bottles. Debris like this gets picked up in the busy Atlantic by strong ocean currents 
high winds and big waves as they make their way northeastwards. As a result, the secluded coves here around Porthcoffin have some of the best beachcombing in Europe. For Nick Dark, beachcombing's been a way of connecting with the wider world. You never quite know when you go onto a beach what there's going to be there. Everything that you find on a beach has been on a journey. It's got a story. Most of it is rubbish, but in amongst that rubbish there's real tre treasures. These are tags and they've got their telephone numbers on them. I call these Kevins because uh, the name of the fishermen who, who I first contacted, they're all fishermen who fish for lobsters in the eastern seaboard of America. What I love about this is that you build a fantastic picture of another community. It's subtly different to the fishing community here in our side of the Atlantic. That's, that to me is the uh, is the, is, the, is, is the magic of it. These are the creme of the creme, the sea beans. They, they, they washed off the floor of the rainforest and they go into the Amazon, let's say, and then they float into the open sea, hit the Gulf Stream, then onto the North Atlantic Dift and, they, and I find them on our beaches. They're very rare, but they should be cherished. They're beautiful things. Beachcombing is basically a, a real love of the beach and the coastline. It's a kind of open door to understanding and it's a way of understanding how, how it all works. These tidal highways bring more than just debris. The Gulf Stream bathes the Cornish coast in warm water and brings with it some surprising visitors. This wild west coast is the shark capital of Britain. And zoologist Miranda Krastovnikov has gone fishing. Over 20 species of shark live in the waters around Britain and here off the North Cornish coast is the best place to see them. One of them is the second biggest fish in the world, the basking shark, and they visit our shores every summer. Basking sharks can grow up to an enormous 10 metres long. And other regular visitors are these mako sharks, whose menacing looking teeth make them look even more terrifying. Neither of these seasonal visitors poses any threat to humans as they survive on plankton and fish only. But there's one species that lives here all year round and it's in real trouble, the poor beagle shark. They're caught commercially because the meat is considered a delicacy on the continent. Unlike basking sharks, they're not protected in any way and there's no limit to how many can be fished. In fact, recently, a Cornish fisherman landed nearly 130 poor beagles on a nine-day fishing trip. Their numbers have declined dramatically in the last few decades. I've joined shark conservationist Richard Pearce on an expedition to catch, tag and release some of these sharks. It's a threatened shark. It's a shark that's on the, on the red list of threatened species, so we're trying to get something done about that as conservationists. The tagging programme that you're running, how does that work? We use commonly this type of tag, which I call a message in a bottle tag. The details, latitude, longitude, date, species, etc., are called on this card. And when caught again, the person who caught it returns that information to us and we can compare the data. But before we can tag a shark, we've got to catch one. We're using a bag of dead fish called chum to entice the sharks around the boat. Sharks have an extraordinary sense of smell, so with any luck, this bag of chum should prove irresistible to them. There's our chum slick marked by the, by the gulls. Hopefully shark swims up slick, find baits, we find shark. 
Once the sharks get close to the boat, we'll hopefully be able to catch them using herring as bait. They eat small sharks, squid, mackerel, pollock, certainly not humans. So people swimming off the beaches here would actually be potentially swimming with poor beagle sharks? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. No one's ever been bitten. Ever? Ever. This may look brutal, but it doesn't harm the shark in the long term. And practically, it's the best way to conserve this threatened species. By tagging, then releasing this shark, Richard hopes that if and when the same shark is recaptured, helpful sport anglers and commercial fishermen will return any tags. This will allow us to build up a complete picture of how it lives and therefore how we can protect it. With its crashing waves and hidden coves, Cornwall has all the ingredients of a good story. It's steeped in legends of piskies and warrior kings, and rich in ancient sites. Like the ruined castle of Tintagel, allegedly the birthplace of King Arthur. But the Cornish stories that have most captured the imagination over the years are those to do with the sea, shipwrecks and smuggling. This is a classic Cornish smugglers track linking a village in land with a secret cove down on the sea. Back in the 17th and 18th centuries, this would have been used by fishermen during the daytime and smugglers at night. This great slot in the cliff has been cut by hand so that carts could be hauled up from the beach. And look at these grooves. They've been eroded by passing cartwheels. It's almost as if the smugglers were here yesterday. Nooks and crannies like this one at Lansalos are tangible reminders of illicit goings on. But there's an even easier way to travel back in time. Just open the books of writer Daphne du Maurier and Cornwall's past rises up to greet you. The dim shape of the stricken ship loomed out of the darkness. He heard the shouts and cries of men. He heard the grim shaking of the torn rigging above the thunder of the breakers. Then out of the mist she swept, desolate, forlorn, like a great and mournful gull with its wings broken, heading for the rocks. He had never known danger, and now it was before him. The great cliff stared up towards him. The smouldering surf rang in his ears like a wild and sweet song. There was a shudder and a crash as the ship struck the first ledge of rock. Du Maurier's shipwrecks, however, weren't just the product of an overactive imagination. In the days of sail, hundreds of vessels came to grief along this inhospitable stretch of the north coast. And one of the most notorious black spots was Hartland Point. Unpredictable winds could smash a ship into matchwood against these jagged rocks. It was a place that struck terror into the hearts of even the most seasoned mariners. Our historians, Mark and Neil, are at Hartland Point, still a ship graveyard. That's astonishing. That's the pro. Right. That's the front half. And then hundreds of yards back down the beach is, is the back section of it. The yeah. bit of the middle has gone missing. And it's just been, it's just been smashed up like an old Coke can. <laughs> just the power of the sea. But not even modern technology can make ships immune to the treachery of this coast. In 1983, the Dutch-owned Johanna ran onto rocks here. So at least it gave local beachcombers something to celebrate. Yeah, yeah, I sort of remember there was a bit of a hoo-ha with the Johanna. Yeah, that was, I think that was the, that was the really interesting thing about it. It was not so much that it ran aground here, but that the locals came down and, and stripped it bare, <laughs> like locusts. 
Over the New Year holiday weekend, queues of cars built up along narrow Devon lanes as people came to plunder the wreck. By the end of their operations, virtually everything of value had disappeared, right down to the last carton of eggs. So who is legally entitled to that? Well, the Cornish think they own everything, really. Everything along the coastline is theirs. But technically, it's really the, the zone between low water and high water, which is fair game. Because booty from wrecked ships has always been so profitable, there are tales up and down this coast of ships being deliberately lured onto the rocks so their cargo could be plundered. I've come to meet a man who's convinced that deliberate wrecking really did happen. Writer Jeremy Seals got a theory about who might have done it. I don't think it happens so much in the seafaring communities because they would know sailors. They would have an empathy with seafaring. Yeah. But on these high cliffs where the life was essentially farming, or further west where they were miners, they yeah. didn't understand seafaring. They had no empathy with them at all, so they were prepared to do it because of that. With all the romantic notions, it's easy to forget that if you deliberately wreck a ship, you know, you're into murder, aren't you? Yeah, no question. Um, this wasn't just malicious damage, you know. If active wrecking happened, people would have died. They'd have, been, they'd have died not only in yeah. the wreck itself, but also there's every chance they'd have been picked off by the wreckers as a way of protecting themselves. Get rid of the witnesses. You know, you mustn't forget there was a law passed against wrecking. Very specifically, in the 1750s, and it specifies that people who, use, who, who wreck by false lights shall be put to death. They, they use the phrase, by false lights. Right, so they, they know then, when that law is passed, that lights are part of it. Absolutely. Right. I mean, an, an essential part of it. To see how a ship could have been fooled onto the rocks by false lights, Mark and I are going to conduct an experiment. Mark's gone to the village of Clavelli to enlist the help of local skipper Mark Myers. <laughs> Hi. Well, should we They're going out to sea out and we're going to try to entice them in, recreating the conditions under which ships could have been deliberately wrecked. So what do we need? Dark night and a yes. big storm, something like that? And also a, a nasty bit of coastline. So that, you've yes. got, <laughs> that, that comes with the territory. Right, let's go. Meanwhile, Jeremy and I have come to a hidden cove further up the coast. Right, there's the, there's the, there's the beach. That looks good. OK. That looks like a perfect wrecker's beach. We'll try and get across this river now before it gets any deeper. Mark and his crew are now out to sea. So... Night's falling fast. So, Roger, should we fill the engine? <laughs> yes, let's do it. Right. Peace and quiet. <laughs> it's just like being in the 18th century again now. OK. We have one candle power. So that is the tool of the wrecker's trade. That's it. Now, look, you've got to have the wind in the right direction. It's got to be strong. So what we're hoping is that a ship out there has no idea where it is and it's looking for any help it can find around it and it mm -hmm. sees a swinging light which it takes because it's moving to be another ship's another ship's light rising and falling with the swell and when it when it thinks there's another ship there why does that reassure the skipper what information does that give him it tells the skipper that there is safe water between where he is and where he's seeing the light so he thinks that he's got room to maneuver basically exactly he knows that there is, there, there is nothing which is going to endanger him between where he is and where the light is. You've got nothing but coastline and, and yeah. all that you can't really see anything. I mean, there's no way of judging these distances out here. I mean, are we 100 yards out? Are we half a mile out? Completely terrifying. You're just sort of... And it, almost between the devil and the deep blue sea. Look, hang on, there's a light over there. Oh, is that, there is, isn't there? Is that a yeah. boat? Hang on, let's go round. With Mark's boat approaching us, can they see our lantern? Although to Mark our candlelight appears far away, their boat is, in fact, only 150 metres from the coast. A ship mistaking this light for another vessel 
would believe there was only sea between the two ships and that it was a long way from the rocks, yeah, an error that would lead to tragedy. Yeah. That could be, yeah. It's, it's a little indistinct, it's very yellowish. Our boat's hardly moving. Uh, and even so, it's hard to keep an instrument like that steady enough yeah. to, to get a good sign on it. Um, hello, Neil, it's Mark here. Hang on, I think we've caught something. Ahoy, Mark! I think I can just about see you. This is our very best attempt at ship at night. I hope it's convincing. I'm surprised how far that candle carries. I tell you, I'm so impressed that you can actually see us. We've only got one candle on the go here. We've only got the power output of a first birthday cake over here. <laughs> That's excellent, Mark. I think you can consider yourself on the point of being wrecked. <laughs> why, don't come, why don't you come a little closer, Mark? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we're not. I, I think we're think going so. back to harbour. See you later. Night. <laughs> Now I've seen how easy it would be to do, it's chilling to think how many sailors might have been deliberately lured to their deaths along this coast. The rugged terrain continues right into Somerset. On the edge of Exmoor, the Great Hangman, the highest sea cliffs in England. And the spectacular Valley of the Rocks formed when the American and European continents were still joined. The last part of our journey takes us up the Bristol Channel to Portbury, near Bristol. One of the busiest ports in Britain, cargo arrives here from all over the world. Containers full of timber from Scandinavia, fruit from Chile, televisions from Korea. and 600,000 cars pass through here every year. The port's ideally placed for the easy distribution of cargo because it cuts deep into the landmass between England and Wales. But despite its good location, the way in is fraught with danger. The Bristol Channel has one of the highest tidal ranges in the world. Billions of gallons of water surge in and out twice a day. This makes it a nightmare for captains unfamiliar with these difficult waters. They rely on specially trained local pilots to help steer their ship into port. It's very difficult to read the map, isn't it? I'm joining pilot Steve Osborne. I wish I'd picked a calmer day. Oh, goodness great, this is really, uh, is this normal? Uh, it, yeah, it's not unusual, let's put it that way. We're just coming out to board the first ship just here, just to the west of this buoy. Yeah. And so we've got a very well-marked channel then, following the deep water. Of course, you can't map a tide, can you? I mean, it's a totally dynamic 3D... It is. It's changing all the time. ...energy force. Yeah. If you do the same ship on two consecutive days, which should be more or less identical conditions, the ship will do completely different things at times, and you have to be ready for that. But you're actually getting on other people's ships. I do, yeah. They've got crews you've never met before. Of every nationality you can think of. Yeah. It? I don't know about the captain today. He may never have been here before. He's probably heard stories about Bristol and the horror, horrendous tides. Oh, really? You mean Bristol has a reputation? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of my main jobs is to reassure the captain, to tell him that, you know, it's OK, and uh, your ship's not in, not in any undue risk. But no matter how well pilots know these waters, they can still take nothing for granted. The extreme tides not only push ships forward with enormous momentum, they also pull them off course. It doesn't help that the tides churn up thousands of tons of silt, mud and sand, making depth sound as unreliable. It's all down to the pilots' expertise to guide them safely towards the port. This is the most dangerous part of the whole operation because Steve's now got to leave the deck of this heaving pilot boat and then somehow make contact with the sheer metal side of this container ship and scramble up a very wet rope ladder. That is not easy to climb. The 
most amazing journey to work I've ever seen. He's now going to navigate that container ship up the Bristol Channel, and I'm going to jump ship onto a tugboat. I've always wanted to travel on a tugboat. But it's when the pilot gets the ship to within a mile of the port that it gets really tricky, and when he needs all the help he can get. That's when tugboats, like the one I'm on, really come into their own. Steve Dingle is the tug skipper. What are we about to do with this tug, Steve? Uh, the tug now is just going to help this ship dock into uh, Portbury, and tonight, or this evening, we're just uh, allocated to push the ship. So how do you stop this huge vessel moving at 20 knots and get it to slow down to a point in which it'll be turned into the dock? The tug that's aft acts as a brake and slows him right down, basically, to stop him. But this is like a minnow pushing a whale, isn't it? Oh, there's a bump. That was us colliding. Gently. Gently, very A gentle gently. collision at sea. Can't believe this tiny tug is pushing a vessel so many times bigger than itself. It's just small and brutal, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Little tough nut. After another 40 minutes of gentle pushing, the entrance to the harbour is in sight and we can breathe a collective sigh of relief. That's it. The ship's safely in the lock and I've successfully negotiated the Wild South West. Next stop, the coast of Wales. It's a part of our coast where extreme tides rule everything. Twice a day, they create one of the world's strangest phenomena, a tidal bore forcing its way up the River Severn. At the other end of the scale, it's rock pools, an entire world in miniature. And with more than its fair share of lighthouses, this coast has many a tale to tell including one of murder and madness. As you get closer, the thought of landing on top of it just gets worse and worse. 